First of all, we have Mary Rose McCall. She's an Australian writer whose first novel, No Safe Place, was runner-up in the 1985 Australian Vogel Literary Award. Her first non-fiction book, The Birth Wars, was a finalist in the 2009 Walkley Awards. Her latest novel, In Falling Snow, tells the largely unknown story of a small group of Scottish women who ran a field hospital in France in World War I in an old abbey. Mary Rose holds degrees in journalism, creative writing, and lives between Brisbane, Australia, and Banff in Canada with her husband and son, and we used to work together at the Museum of Brisbane in Brisbane City Council. Uh, and then we have Naomi Takafanga. Naomi is the exhibitions manager at the State Library of Queensland. She's passionate about leading the most creative team at the State Library and pushing the boundaries with exhibition presentation and visitor engagement. The exhibition team is charged with the task of bringing SLQ's collections and Queensland memory to life in creative experiences throughout the library and around the state, the state public library and the, in the indigenous knowledge centres. Uh, and then we have Linda. Linda's been the exhibitions project curator at the State Library of Queensland since 2011. Linda's delivered the, give it a little wave, Linda, so you know who we all are. Uh, Linda delivered the Flund Lines project, which many of you might have seen, and has recently finished working on transforming Tyndale. Previous to that, Linda played a support role in other major SLQ exhibitions, including Straight Home and Lumia, The Art and Light Motion, and has worked as an independent curatorial projects while also being a practicing artist in her own, in her own right. And I think uh, you're going to talk that Floodlines is touring the state at the moment, isn't it? And then we have Councillor George Seymour. George holds the Community, Family and Cultural Services portfolio on the Fraser Coast Regional Council and has recently been appointed to the Queensland Heritage Council. He's the chairperson the, of the organising committee for Maryborough Open House, which has been a very successful free event, uh, which... Uh, opens up historic buildings to the public and seeks to foster interest in local history and, and architecture. Great event. Give a little wave. And at our far end, we have uh, Mayor Clifford Harrigan. And, and Clifford's come all the way from Woodrow Woodrow. He was elected the Mayor of Woodrow Woodrow in May 2012, the last local government elections. He's responsible for all portfolios of the council and is chairman of the portfolio committees covering infrastructure, economic development, community and lifestyle, and law and order. He's a traditional owner of the Woodrow Woodrow, and his personal interests are fishing, with you there, gardening, not so, reading and spending quality time with his wife and three daughters. Clifford also belongs to a band, as we heard earlier, called Black Image, which is located in far north Queensland. Black Image won a deadly award in 2007 and Band of, band of the Year and were finalists again in 2011. Uh, Clifford, to this day, performs with Black Image at private functions and festivals across Australia and, as we heard, he's performing tonight down in the cafe. So what I'd like to do is we'll hear from all our panel members first and we'll just keep going straight through and then can I ask you to make little notes about the, because you'll be going, oh, I've got a question, I've got a question. Make notes about the questions you want to ask, and then at the end, we've got, we've got time for questions. So, without further ado, I'd like to call on Mary. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Peter. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good, good. Okay, um, I'm not going to stand behind the lectern because I'm so tall, it, uh, you know, it sometimes kind of creates a problem for people. Um, well, I'm supposed to tell you about stories this morning, uh, kind of how to, how, to, how to write stories or how to make up stories, but I have to tell you that I'm a novelist and, uh, as Margaret Atwood said, m my job really is to create plausible whoppers that um, <laughs> the rest of you can enjoy, so I I'm not sure that that's what librarians are supposed to do in terms of stories. Um, I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to create plausible whoppers. Um, and as well as that, I work alone. Uh, in, in writing novels, you, you kind of work in a little room and then about every 10 years, you kind of come out and like a, get caught like a rabbit in headlights like I am today, and then you go back to your little room and work again. Whereas, now I have this vision for librarians and what it'll show you is that I never lived in a, a, in a university college or boarding school. Um, my vision is, you know, like uh, collective nouns. So if you've got a kind of a murder of crows and a, what is it, it's a trip of goats and my favourite is a sort of a murmuration of starlings, what would a, a group of librarians be? And I'm not going to say it's a collection. 
because my view is that you'd have a dorm. And, uh, and I have this kind of vision of librarians sitting around, playing guitars, singing, and coming up with really great ideas together as they drink hot chocolate on a Friday night. Um, <laughs> and I tell you, where I get that vision is from Louise de Noon, who is here. Um, <laughs> Because when she was with the Museum of Brisbane, she involved me, along with a whole lot of other creative people, in coming up with some stories. And I hadn't really ever worked collaboratively on stories before, and it was so much fun. Uh, and the stories were so much better because of the experience. So, so that's forever sort of sealed my view of what librarians do. So I don't actually feel I can teach you anything much at all about creating stories. But what I can tell you a little bit about uh, is World War I, and I know that the, the centenary is coming up uh, next year, and I'm sure it's exercising quite a few librarians and historians' minds um, as it's been sort of exercising mine for 12 years. Although I have to say that 12 years ago, when I thought about World War I, I just wanted to go to sleep, really. I'd sort of had enough of it. Um, and uh, I don't know if, um, if other people feel the same way, but I better stick to my script because I've got 15 minutes. So I'm going to talk about this novel, um, In Falling Snow, uh, which um, it's a novel set in, in World War I, and I'm going to call this talk when I work out how to do a, use a PC. Hi, I'm a PC, I'm a Mac. Um, I'm going to call this The Six Days of In Falling Snow. And, uh, uh, and, I'm going to call, and, and on the seventh day, of course, we rest, but we won't worry about that. Oh, first day. It did it. Good. Um, I'm used to using the Mac. Uh, so the, 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 the sort of... Um, I, I, I'm going to start with a story, and I'm sorry if, if, if those of you have heard me speak before and you've heard this story before. At the end of this talk, uh, after the six days, I really only know one thing, um, and that's the only thing I'm going to tell you. And so if you've heard this story before, just be reassured by the fact that I know more about that one thing than I did last time I told this story. <laughs> and it's a story about my mother, who was a journalist in the 1950s. I don't have to ask you how many of you have heard of Enid Blyton, the children's writer. I do have to ask some groups that, including school teachers. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, so when Enid Blyton came to Australia in the 1950s when my mother was a beautiful young journalist and uh, Brisbane was the only place she stopped. I'm telling you a story, this may not be true. Uh, so Brisbane was the only place she stopped and she had a press conference out at the airport. And um, just imagine the scene, you know, there's this kind of gaggle of journalists from the Sydney and Melbourne papers. There's someone from the British publisher, someone from the Australian uh, government, someone from the, the High Commission. And there's my beautiful young mother kind of in the, in the midst of it, watching Miss Blyton as she shimmers across the tarmac in, as my mother will report faithfully the next day, an aqua twin set and pearls, looking not so much like Miss Enid Blyton as she does like the young Queen Elizabeth. So she, Miss Blyton gets into the kind of hangar where they're having the press conference and it's very hot. Not like here where it's very cold. And so there's an introduction from the British publisher, there's a kind of a thank you from the Australian government, and then it's time for questions. My mother has noticed that Miss Blyton hasn't said anything yet, and a journalist from Sydney, not my mother, a journalist from Sydney asks the first question, which is, Miss Blyton, where do you get the ideas for the naughty stories? Enid Blyton, the, fir the fan, kind of turns slowly. Enid Blyton cocks her head, looks at the questioner as if he's a dog that's spoken, and says, why, Noddy tells me. <laughs> now, now, in our family, that was a story about mad old Enid Blyton, um, but, and this is the one thing that I know, um, a, 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 having kind of worked on stories for the last 20 years, if you're listening, Noddy will come in and tell you. <laughs> but you have to be listening. Which brings me to uh, In Falling Snow. Um, as I said before, I had no interest in World War I. Um, uh, for a start, many people have written better books than I could write about World War I. And secondly, um, uh, I, don't, I grew up, I, I was a child when the Vietnam protests were on. So for me, war was just something that was wrong. And so I just, you know, I would never have had kind of any interest in, in writing about war. And so how did I get 
uh, you know, from that position kind of to a novel that pretty well 90% of it is set um, during the war. Well, um, I was in the, the wrong aisle at, oh, I know, that's right, I've got to have a slide now. And what do I do? Press the space bar. Yes. This is not a library. You probably know that. This is my bookshelf at home. But I was in the wrong aisle at the University of Queensland Library. I was looking, incidentally, for a book called What Happens When You Die um, for my second novel, Angels in the Architecture. And I came acro across this book, The Women of Royamont, a Scottish women's hospital on the Western Front. And uh, I don't know what appealed to me about it. Uh, the Scottish, the women at Royamont, um, hospital, it, whatever it was, I sat down and started reading and I forgot about what happens when you die because I then took this book out and I took it home and uh, I read the rest of it that night and I, it, I just was fascinated. This, this group of suffragists uh, at the beginning of World War I put aside the cause. They wrote to the war office and said, we can start a hospital for you. The war office said, go home and sit still, you're women. Um, so they wrote to the French Red Cross and the Serbian government and, and uh, who said, yes, thank you, we, we'll, we'll take two. Um, and they set up uh, a hospital in a 12th century Cistercian Abbey north of Paris. Now, had anyone heard of this story before, uh, either they read my novel, most of you, all of you have read my novel, or, <laughs> or, or, or today. I, I mean, I haven't met very many people who've heard that story, and yet what an incredible story it is. But it, but it isn't quite a story yet, it's actually just a setting. It's just a setting and a whole lot of stuff that happened. Um, uh, and for me, stories always have that kind of image or book or scene or I setting uh, or intellectual trigger, and then they also um, have uh, an emotional kind of thump in the chest. Um, and for me, that was my grandmother dying. My grandmother was born in 1898, uh, and she was um, she ran my grandfather's medical practice and. Uh, and spent her life raising children. But when she died, it created an enormous hole in my life because she was one of those magic grandmothers. And I started to wonder for the first time, how might her life have been different? How might you know, her experiences have kind of been different? Don't worry, days four to six go a lot quicker than days one to three. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're still on day one. Um, how might her life have been, oh, I knew that had happened. There you go. Um, I didn't want to do that. How might her life have been different? And so now we have the idea of a story. We've got a young woman, Iris Crane. She's 21 years of age. Why would she go to France instead of marrying Al and, and staying in his practice? Well, of course she'd go because her brother Tom has run away to war. And, but instead of going and finding Tom, she instead meets Miss Frances Ivans, who's running this hospital at Royamont, and her life is kind of completely changed, and on we go. So, had I not been listening to Noddy, I never would have found the book at the University of Queensland. I never would have had the emotional thump in the chest from my mother, uh, from my grandmother's death. And so, I was listening to Noddy, which is that kind of, that creative self that we've all got. Watch Ken Robinson on TED, if you don't believe me. Uh, he says it a lot better than me. His, st his stories are funnier as well. Um, uh, because it, that was what I was doing, and so the, the story came to me. So, now we've got the sort of idea for a story, it's time for a trip. Um, and I found Royamont on the internet, as you do. I think it was called the internet in those days. This is a long time ago. And I wrote to them and said, I'm a writer and I'm interested in writing a novel set there. And they offered residencies to, to um, artists. And I went and I spent two weeks there uh, walking the footsteps of the women who'd, who'd been at Royamont. And that was an extraordinary experience. I still had no interest in writing a book about war. To me, I was writing a book about women um, and women's experiences. And so here we go, this is the Abbey uh, early in the morning. I tried to iron that fold out of the photograph um, that you see down the middle and the photograph was destroyed by the iron. Uh, this is the only remaining copy, sadly. Um, and that was my desk looking over the cloisters. Uh, see, in those days they even had Walkmans still <laughs> to listen to. Um, I've got four minutes to go. Wow, okay, so I only started at 12. Um, Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, in terms of the first day, the really important thing is to listen to Noddy. Um, uh, on the second day, you write. The first and second days are going to be the longest. Um, and uh, for me, what that means is, on the second day, you write. And for me, that means uh, 12 years of doing this. Um, 
I work in notebooks, I write up little doodads and stuff like that, uh, and then it eventually coalesces into a novel. Um, and then you go to Banff. Um, I, spent, <laughs> I spent seven months at the Banff Centre for the Arts. It was originally supposed to be seven weeks. Um, I can't stress to you enough the key role of caffeine in what a novelist does. Um, I was going to, yeah, seven months in Canada at the Banff Centre, pulling in Falling Snow together as a novel. Um, and that was the view outside the cafe where I ordered those coffees. Um, and that was the review from my room at the Banff Centre. So the third day is research, and I really do want to say this point, that a lot of people think you research first and then write. I don't agree with that. You write first and ask questions later. Um, and the reason I think that's very important is that, um, for me at least, uh, what matters is the story and listening to Noddy. And if you're researching too early, you're not listening to Noddy. Um, the text that did help, both when I was writing, though, and when I was in the research uh, phase, and I liked what Jeanette said this morning about oral history, Voices from the time were really important. So I like newspapers, letters, diaries, sound recordings, um, sound recordings of African soldiers, uh, stories about boy soldiers, accounts of nurses, da 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 da. These were the texts that helped. Um, and the key thing about that was that uh, the, the novel then became a novel that included those stories. So there's lesbians in the novel, there's lots of African soldiers who were just taken from their homes and brought to the war and stuff like that. Because the amazing thing that kind of happened to me when I was in this research phase was that I started to get to know these people at Royamon and I started really wanting to write a novel about war and I in particular started to get to know Frances Ivans who's in the middle there, the tall woman uh, who ran the hospital, that, oh, that's a painting from the hospital, and wanted to honour and, uh, and tell their stories. And I also uh, found out a lot about boy soldiers because my grandfather, Andre Dougal McColl, was a boy soldier in World War I. I started having some interest in his history. Um, so that's the third day. We've only got three days left. We'll be all right. Um, oh, yes. So the rules that I then made up for myself in the research phase for my later revising was if something really happened, I tried not to alter it. So I used many, many stories from what really happened at Royamont, and I can tell you about those at lunch if you want. Uh, where I didn't know, I tried to make up as honestly as I could. Um, this is a very hard thing to do in fiction and non-fiction, this thing of honesty. Um, uh, uh, Leah touched on this earlier, and our, and our honouring the people whose stories we're telling. I've got a lot of experience with doing that with non-fiction. Um, and it's just a very, very important thing and, and it's very easy for dishonesty to creep in, but it won't do so if you are listening to Noddy, exactly. Um, uh, yes, and I repeated this slide because it matters in the re <laughs> revising stage as well. The fourth day we revise, um, which I'll talk, to, uh, I'll talk to you about at lunch if anyone wants to, the fifth day re we rest. And the sixth day we revise again. This is the only time you don't listen to Noddy because he'll tell you another book. And, and you don't need another book at this stage. You need to do what the damn copy editor says and finish. So if Noddy starts talking to you, don't. So what happens on the seventh day? And I'm going to finish with the seventh day. Um, I won't get time to read, which I really want to do, but that's okay. Um, on the seventh day, what you do is you find out that your great uncle um, had something to do with the dawn of flight. Uh, in the 1920s, and, and, and a guy who thought that we might just fly for leisure. And of course, that takes you to Loris Bonney, who was an Australian pilot who flew further than uh, what's her name, who had just a better PR machine. Um, <laughs> and you might want to kind of tell her story. And that, of course, takes you to your mother, who died a couple of weeks ago, and who lived through that period of, uh, of history. And you get the emotional thump in the chest. And once again, what are you doing? You're listening to Noddy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Naomi. Can I now ask Naomi, if you, who's the exhibitions manager for the State Library of Queensland? And it sounds like you're all going to have to go and buy a noddy. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, Linda and I have been invited uh, here today to talk about the Bloodlines exhibition at SLQ. I'm not entirely sure how to follow on from, um, from Leah or Mary Rose, but we're going to give it a shot. Okay. Uh, so exhibitions at SLQ uh, fits within um, a broader programming framework and we describe it as, and it's just new so let me read it, creating memorable experiences that celebrate contemporary culture in an environment that fosters the exchange of ideas and creation of new knowledge. So we're still tweaking it. So as part of that, the exhibitions team are committed to curating exhibitions 
that creatively tell the story in order to inspire our audience uh, to question and to engage deeply with Queensland culture. So it's storytelling and it equals content um, in context. Okay, so um, our exhibitions are complemented by a strong public program of events. Um, and uh, Jeanette mentioned it before, and so we're getting a little bit of bang for um, buck here in terms of promoting Black Image Band. So just just stepping on or just touching on why it's important. <laughs> Gone forward one too many. Uh, is that the public program to our events is in, you know it's incredibly important. So not only um, is uh, Black Image Band performing as part of a prelude to the. Um, the, the next major programming here at SLQ. We're also uh, filming a digital story. So we've got um, the Kuril Dargan team who are leading that, and, uh, and then that forms content, forms part of um, an exhibition that's coming up. So it's, it's a, a very important link. Um, okay, so our visitors are our most important asset, and uh, their feedback and comments drive what we do. Increasingly, we are not only inviting our community to provide material for our programs, but taking the next step and seeking active uh, co-curators. Okay, so on to the next one. Okay, so where did it all start? So this is concept to gallery. So in the summer of 2010-11, Queensland experienced what has been known, become known as the Summer of Sorrow. At one point, we were toying with the idea of calling the exhibition SOS, but it was, um, you know, it, we went with floodlines and called A Living Memory to really be able to capture the story that Queensland has experienced. So severe flooding occurred with most of the state declared a disaster zone. An SLQ here nestled by the river um, experienced extensive damage to the lower levels, um, lift wells, car parks, mass storage areas, as did the rest of the cultural precinct. Uh, so it was during the clean-up period, while staff um, were knee-deep in mud and witnessing the mammoth clean-up effort uh, in Brisbane, but also via media around the state. And uh, it was agreed that SLQ needed to establish a record of this event. And it was cemented a few weeks later when Cyclone Yasi hammered the north. Uh, so over the next 14 months, State Library staff from a number of areas, so with Queensland memory and learning participation and um, a variety of um, areas, worked towards an exhibition that would capture the events of that summer in an interactive experience. So we didn't want it to be a traditional style experience, we wanted people to experience in the way that the images um, were captured. So through a tapestry of stories, exhibitions and events and immersive digital technology, Floodline shared memories of Queensland's floods, past and present, across two exhibitions. And at the heart of Floodlines was a commemoration of the resilience and community spirit of Queenslanders in the face of devastating natural disasters. So uh, just touching on, so there was two exhibitions as mentioned. So Floodlines 19th century Brisbane in the Philip Bacon heritage space gave context to the events of contemporary Queensland and worked as a perfect sister exhibition for Floodlines A Living Memory. And that celebrated the power of communities, stories and spirit. The ex exhibition brought together multiple projects formed from collaborators with co-curators, independent artists and creative agencies to create not only a unique exhibition, but an important knowledge bank and public resource for future generations. And I'll pass over to Linda to, um, to talk on two points. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, at the heart of every exhibition are stories, and with such a widespread disaster, we knew that the community's voice and storytelling would be an important part of the Floodlines exhibition. There was a sense that everyone felt they had a role to play, whether that was to provide refuge for friends and family, become a prolific baker, or to roll up their sleeves and join the Mud Army. But the story of floodlines doesn't begin with the flood of 2010-11. And I wanted to show you this graph, which was part of the 19th century Brisbane exhibition, um, to show the repeating pattern of serious flooding in Brisbane since the 1800s. The stories in the exhibition from 19th century Brisbane created a context for what had just happened, with stories of survival, loss and recovery unfolding in ways that eerily mirror contemporary experiences. So today I wanted to focus on stories in the exhibition that have the, the potential to be forgotten and some of the less traditional methods that we used in floodlines to bring such stories to light. The first one that we're looking at is the Queensland Flood and Cyclone Mosaic. 
The Mosaic is a crowdsourced collection initiative in the form of an interactive and moving digital artwork. Sorry. Do you want me to show you? <laughs> On the link, yeah. What had become apparent was the use of personal devices to capture experiences and the sharing of images and stories on social media. Six months before the exhibition opened, the mosaic was launched and spread Queensland Ride through our network of public libraries. People were encouraged to contribute their images of the 2010-11 floods and Cyclone Yazi. This artwork was displayed as a large-scale projection in the SLQ Gallery, where it continues to be exhibited as part of the travelling exhibition, and images can still be uploaded, uploaded via the Floodlines website and at visiting libraries allowing us to continue to grow our collections and maintain audience engagement. Now, we, there is meant to be a link, but it's not working, so this is uh, our, a zooming and constantly regenerating mosaic, and uh, the images um, that people, the public have uploaded become part of the mosaic. The second one we're going to talk about is Flood of Ideas, and I want to start off with this quote as an example of why it's important to share stories from generation to generation. How we could better respond to future floods dominated conversations and media coverage following the 2011 floods. Flood of ideas came about out of a desire to collect and document all of those ideas and to convey a spirit of optimism, creativity and forward thinking as we move forward from these devastating events. Flood of ideas was a joint initiative between Healthy Waterways, Water by Design and SLQ which culminated with a public exhibition statewide student ideas competition and a research project. Its legacy was then displayed as part of the Floodlines exhibition. The next one is augmented reflections. Augmented reflections harnesses augmented reality technology to visualise the effect of the floods and cyclone Yazi on Queensland. Working in collaboration with Joseph Mark to develop an app for iPhones and iPads, Visitors could see the effects of rising waters across Brisbane and surrounding areas along a 48-hour timeline. And this is an example of the Milton suburb that was modelled. We wanted to provide a different perspective of the floods, and this project also speaks to SLQ's commitment to digital literacy. The one that you're seeing now is of uh, Cardwell Foreshore from Cyclone Yazi. The free app can be downloaded from the app Apple iTunes store and used at home by downloading the markers from the Floodline website. So we have some markers here today. If anybody wants to um, take them home, we'll leave them down the front. As with all our exhibitions, our learning team developed learning notes for teachers and students, also available on our website, and Augmented Reflections continues to be used as a learning tool in schools and uni universities around Australia. To ensure the exhibition remains relevant as it travels, further AR areas have been modelled to include the effects of Cyclone Yazi on Ingham, Tully and Cardwell, and modelling is almost complete for Toowoomba and Dolby. And this, that was a sneak peek of the uh, Toowoomba model. No? Yeah? No. no. <laughs> Wrong slide, that's Cardwell. Uh, the last one I'd like to talk about is the children's activities. Now, it would seem in an exhibition about disaster and recovery that would not be ideal for children, but we recognise that children also uh, experienced the floods and had a story to tell. It had also been identified in our collections that little had been captured on the experience of children during pre previous significant natural disasters. So two activity-based projects were developed. First was a touch screen activity where we asked children to share their big ideas about flood proofing Queensland and we got some pretty crazy ideas like um, houses with balloons on them and uh, strange boats and spacecrafts. The second was a magnetic mural to encourage children to share their stories and feelings about the flood and I think we're all amazed at how popular this one became. Lastly, I wanted to talk about regional outreach. Throughout the four-month ex exhibiting period at SLQ, visitor feedback was overwhelmingly positive with on-site attendance of over 24,000 visitors. The exhibition is now touring in a scaled-down version to public libraries throughout Queensland. We maintain a blog as it travels and li local library staff are encouraged to add to the blog and share their local community's response to the exhibition. At the moment, we have two examples 
we go back to that slide. So the first example is from Mackay, and they um, coincided a launch of their own exhibition called 150 Years of Resilience, Mackay's Natural Disasters with the launch of Floodlines. And, the sec and that's the, the one on the top left-hand side. And the second one are images from Claremont Library who invited the community to create a, dis a display by adding their own flood images. And they're great ways for local communities to become involved and we really encourage um, local libraries to add to that blog. So floodlines will be exhibited at 46 public libraries throughout Queensland over the next four years. The travelling exhibition is currently on display at Atkin Vale Library from 9th to the 19th of March and to date over 35,000 regional visitors have seen the touring exhibition. Thanks Linda. Okay, we're almost ready. So just in conclusion, um, we just wanted to show how stories influence and connect generations and why it's important to uh, create locally and share globally. So what we have here um, is a story um, that was filmed um, by the um, Queensland Memory um, area to, um, to capture. So the Wall of Stories, which was exhibited, was a collection of digital stories of media footage that was with ABC Open, ABC, um, the Milpera State School, the Queensland and New South Wales Police Service and uh, stories from the SLQ collection. So if we had a minute or two, how are we going for time? Yeah, we've done yeah. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> Um, so we just want to show an excerpt of, um, of the digital story with helicopter pilot Mark Kempton. We went up there thinking we were going to look and try and find a couple of people trapped on a fire truck surrounded by water. When we arrived at Grantham, I think for a moment there, there was just stunned silence in the aircraft. And I'm just like, my God, this is just a massive flood. We're going to have to start working and get these people out of this. Mark, thanks for talking to us today. Now tell me, what's the attraction of being a helicopter pilot? I think um, being a helicopter pilot is the best job in the world. You get to strap this machine to your back and just go for a walk in space. Um, your office window is continually changing and you can just see life from a whole different perspective. And um, at the point when you're flying, you're just so engrossed. I mean, you, you're, you're part of that machine, you know, you just, you just linked into it is what I'm trying to say. And it's almost like, slow motion in your head for a, for a second but it's such instantaneous. We also have the ability to go and land anywhere with a helicopter which is why it's such a, a beautiful machine. The trauma and things that we can get to and deal with immediately really enables us to operate and help people within what they call the golden hour. Talking about Grantham and the rescue that happened there, did anything in your training in the past prepare you for the situation that you confronted? Jenny, Grantham was just an extraordinary situation to be faced with. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon by the time we arrived at Grantham. The weather that day was absolutely atrocious. It was the worst flying conditions you could ever imagine. If you had a choice, you wouldn't fly. It was a lot of heavy rain. There was um, low cloud, there was storms around, there was a lot of lightning, there was sheet lightning, bolt lightning. Um, there was every terrible part of weather you could imagine. And we ducked and weaved um, up that valley to get there to start with. And as we arrived over Grantham, the flood water that was smashing through was really just a total shock to us. There's trucks being pushed along, there's boats, there's an aeroplane floats past in front of me with the tail of the aeroplane sticking out of the water. And there's people dotted on every roof you can see, 50, 60, 70 people just sitting there looking at us. And I said to our guys, what are we gonna do here? How, how are we gonna tackle this? Um, and then you start to think, wow, there's all those people on the roofs, who's in the water? So how did you tackle that? You're there, you're thinking, I've got all these people I need to rescue. How do you approach it? Who, who do you take first? Well, that's, that's the biggest question, Jenny. And um, as it turned out for us, we looked at, were there any people in the water? Who was in the most dire circumstances to start with? And we couldn't see anyone um, because of the amount of water that was moving and the debris that was in it. So we started at the most western point of town and just work our way to logically fill the aircraft up with as many as we could, then take them back to a higher ground, place them off, and then go back and start the process again. We had about two hours approximately worth of fuel. Over the period, we winched 28 people on board our aircraft, which is um, 
pretty amazing and, and even now I think about it and I, it's hard to believe that we got that many people and you know we had no idea at the time we just kept going and going and going until well I landed back at Archerfield with five minutes of fuel left in the tanks before we went into the fixed reserve so I couldn't cut it any finer than what we did. Of those 28 people that you rescued which was the most difficult rescue in that, that two hour time? I think the most difficult one was the one uh, with friend Fran and Ken Arndt. Um, that's because they were clinging to trees and, and what was extraordinary with this Jenny was the fact that we were going towards a house with about five people on top of this roof but as we were going towards them they were pointing to the trees and I said to Paso, these people are pointing at something mate, I can't see anything, we couldn't see anything in the trees and we got closer to the house the downwash of the helicopter um, blew the trees apart and we could see these two little heads sitting down in the tree sort of looking up at us and we thought, wow, there's people trapped there, let's get them first. So when uh, Paso winch Mark down, Mark was swept under the trees and we lost sight of him. That's a very dangerous situation when you're winching because if it gets snagged on something and the aircraft moves the wrong direction, the aircraft um, would act like a pendulum attached to the winch cable and we would end up crashing the aircraft into the water um, or into the roofs or the trees that we were hovering next to. That was really a dangerous time for us. Um, Paso said that he'd lost sight um, and that he might have to cut the cable. I said to Paso, let's just wait, let's just wait a little while, um, which seemed like forever but was probably only seconds. And I said, well, just give him some time and then when you're ready, just winch the cable in. And as it turned out, as Paso winched Mark up, he popped out of the trees with a survivor, which happened to be Fran. And based on what had happened on that first one, we knew that he'd go into the trees, we'd give him a period of time, he'd get the strop around Ken, and then we'd winch them up. So that was pretty extraordinary, actually, that one, to, uh, to get through that and get those two out of that scenario. It's still very raw for us as well, you know, we, um, I don't see myself as a hero and neither does Paso or Mark or anyone else, you know, we just went and did our job and we wanted to help people. I mean, we were all on an emotional tightrope, um, we were stressed to the maximum with what we did, we were concerned that we left people behind, we were, I was horrified that people had died out there and that we couldn't help them. I think it's going to take a, quite a while to just process the whole thing. I mean, for me, it was very emotional because my house was flooded as well. So I've been on both sides of the fence. So I was the rescuer and then I needed to be rescued as well. So I, I really saw the other side that perhaps in other jobs I hadn't seen before, so. Where were you when you heard that your own house was going to go under the water? It was on the second day, um, on the 11th of January. Um, I'd gone back to work that morning at about 4 a.m. To, to get back on board the aircraft and fly it out. And then my mobile phone rang, and it's Julie, my wife, saying, hey, um, Ross has just come in from next door and said we're going to be flooded, and by the way, there's water pouring in the back from the stormwater drains and the gutters are overflowing. Um, what am I gonna do? I just said, Jules, just get our boys and get out of the house. Leave everything and just get out of the house. Because I'm suddenly thinking, oh my God, if, if, it's, if it's flooding there, is it gonna come through there like it did with Grant? They're not knowing exactly what was happening. In the next day or so, friends and strangers just came from everywhere. Can we give you a hand, mate? Can we help you? You know, just, I mean, everyone saw, you know, the community response, the thousands that wanted to come. And uh, it really, it heartened the soul to think, you know, yeah, people, um, are out there and, and they do feel for other people and they do want to help. Just things on that level you start to think about with having been flooded and been through the disaster and, um, and having the interaction with some of you know, our survivors like the Martin family and what they're going through. You really, you know, you just, everyone's in their own level of pain, but the pain is relative to what you're going through because you're all going through the same pain. It's the same mud in your house, you know, it's the same memories that have been destroyed and lost that are never going to come back. But in amongst all that, my 13-year-old son Mackenzie said something to me one day when we were standing in the house and I think I was pretty upset at the time and he said to me, he goes, put my hand on, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Dad, don't worry, we will rebuild our kingdom of awesomeness, which is what he's called our home. And that just blew me away. I thought, wow, you know, the little fella is taken on that role to, to support me, which was just a magnificent thing. And um, for us, you know, I'm alive. I'm, my wife's alive, my son's alive, you know. That is so important that they now understand that no matter how bad anything can get, 
even if our house is destroyed, we will always be all right, even though we go in and out of emotions and, and you know, we might be angry, we might be sad, we might be happy, whatever that is, we will always be strong together as a family and be able to support each other and we will get through it. And I have to say now, I say to people when they talk about the floods, I said, well, yeah, 2011 floods, we lived through that. And that's something pretty special, you know, even though it's not something that you want to ever go through, but we have lived through it. We have survived it. Um, we've helped people survive it, but we've lived through it ourselves. And as a group and as a family, we've been able to, um, you know, come together again and, um, and just talk about that. And I think that's really important for all of us. Thanks, Linda and Naomi. Um, gorgeous example, that Floodlines project, of how strategic that whole initiative is, to my mind. It's one of those examples of where here's an iconic event that's part of our you know, identity in Queensland, you know, even happening again now. And what you've cleverly done is that stuff of um, developing collection through your exhibition, as well as, a as well as drawing collection, drawing from the collection making new meaning and actually developing new knowledge. Um, that, I work a lot with the architecture industry and I saw that booklet at many different architecture practices about what, what are we going to do with flood stuff in the future. So a really, a really um, smart, smart initiative. Okay, our next smart initiative, can I draw upon Councillor George? Thanks. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. I'm really pleased to be um, talking about Maribor Open House. I'm a councillor on the Fraser Coast Regional Council, which includes um, Fraser Island, Tarby Bay, and of course, Maribor. Um, so last year, in conjunction with the National Trust, we held um, Maribor Open House for the first time. And what that involved um, last October the 27th was opening up um, 20 historic buildings to the public uh, for free talks with archaeologists, architects, and historians, and bus and walking tours around historic areas of the, um, of the city. Um, a key, a key um, aspect of Maribor Open House is trying to uncover and showcase the history that's all around us in Maribor. Maribor has um, an extremely high um, number of state heritage listed buildings. I think it's the real asset of what Maribor has. There are some point places in Maribor where you can stand and within your line of sight see seven, eight, or nine state heritage listed buildings. Um, on one corner, the intersection of Wharf Street and Richmond Street, all four corner buildings are state heritage listed, and in most cases, the next two or three buildings are listed as well. This is um, a very unique and extraordinary, in my view, um, sort of preservation of a CBD in the wider town. Um, and I think it, it really um, it, it, it provides the um, imagination and um, perspective that Maribor sees as its own identity and it seeks to promote. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, the, the, um, the buildings, they're really just the bricks and mortar. The real value behind them is the stories, um, the stories of the people in the community that, that lie behind them. Last week, I was at one of the historical societies. We have three in Maribor, and they don't talk to each other. But I was at, <laughs> I, I was at one, and it was the value, the valuing the, um, it was a, I was the judge for um, a photographic competition for five, where there's five generations of a family in one photograph. And amazingly, it's not that uncommon. I thought it would be for a baby to have, a, an infant to have a, a great, great grandmother. My, my wife has a photo like that. And in Maribor, I'm talking to the entrance, you know, in the photograph um, competition, the families. And they all reference their family history to buildings, whether it's the schools they went to, the, um, you know, the workshops and engineering firms that the fathers and the, the males were all worked in, the hospitals they were all in, and particularly in Maribor, like the central CBD, we still have a great shopping street with lots of historic buildings. Um, so this is really what we wanted to tap into in Maribor Open House. Um, the history that's there that people that can be told, the untold stories that can be told through the, through the buildings. So um, that top left-hand one, that's Badau House, one of the more um, well-known houses of Maribor. I guess you'd describe it as um, a Georgian mansion. However, it was built in the Victorian era. I think there's, um, there would be a lag of but when architects leave England, they're still designing what they saw there. Um, and 
um, that, that building was actually built, um, purchased by Anne and Ian Russell in 2003, and it was in something of a dilapidated state. And um, Anne's quite a well-known author, publishing under Anne Delisle, her former name. And um, her, her um, I guess it's a work of, non, um, of, of, of nonfiction, um, the memoir about their time renovating that building, um, A Grand Passion, is um, a really remarkable story about um, all the families that have lived there and this, you know, the stories behind those walls. Um, the next house, Sherlock Home, um, we found that of the, all, of the 20 buildings, so it's the five or six houses that were most popular, more than a thousand people went through both of those houses in the space of five or six hours. Sherlock Home, um, I guess you'd describe it as one of the family seats for the Courser family, which is one of the prominent families in Maryborough, providing a lot of the business leaders, lawyers, state and uh, federal MPs. Um, and, I mean, it's just a great um, building with tongue and groove paneling, um, shady verandas and pointed gables. But um, one thing that I've been cognizant of since last open house and planning for the next one is that all the houses that we had open on the day looked like that. They, um, I guess you describe them as the upper house classes, uh, the upper class houses. And one thing I'd really like to showcase this year at Maribor Open House is the workers' cottages, uh, the cottages of the people, um, you know, the masses, the people um, who didn't vote for Courser when he won by two votes in a by-election 100 years ago, people like Andrew Fisher, um, people that tell the real story of, of Australia, the working class heroes, Andrew Fisher, who lived in Maribor for, for a short period of time, um, first went to the coal mines um, working at, at the age of 10, by um, his teenage years, he was a union leader and blacklisted for leading the strikes. So he had to move out to Australia to find work. He found work in a coal mine near Maribor, And then he went on to, into state parliament, being a minister in the Anderson Dawson ministry, the first elected labor government in the world here in Queensland, documented in Ross Fitzgerald's excellent book, Seven Days to Remember. They didn't last very long. And um, then he went on to be prime minister of Australia. And he went back to UK, the, the country that he left as a teenager, blacklisted and unemployable, as Australia's High Commissioner. And Maribor tells part of that story. The houses that he, that he lived in, the, the old um, rundown, um, dilapidated mines, and that's, um, that's an important part of Australian history. It's something that Maribor can be proud of. The bottom left building is City Hall, where I work. Um, there's a lot of stories behind that. I was a tour guide on the day. Every day I walk through there and I see a bust of um, an old white man who said, who it says donated $10,000 for the construction of it, and I don't think much of it, but on the day I found out that that $10,000 was his life savings. And you tell people that today, and nobody can understand it. That it's just mind-boggling that somebody would have that civic pride that would voluntarily donate $10,000 when, I mean, there's a huge industry today of tax minimization of people withdrawing from public um, life and donations. Um, the bottom right-hand building is the Brennan and Garrity, um, shop, which is uh, run by the National Trust and is a great um, tourism draw card for Maribra. Um, just a few more of, the, of just an example of some of the buildings. Um, the top left hand is uh, the Anglican Church. That photo is taken from a pub that was open on the day as well, the Bells View, and is across from um, the old Maribra Railway Station, which will be open this year. The next, um, that's a house on Lennox Street on the right hand corner. They were extremely popular. One thing I would say to people who um, are thinking of having an open house for their, in their town is that while the houses are most popular, they are the most work. With the churches, they provide the volunteers and they know all the stories and they're really keen. Whereas with the houses, obviously, there's a lot of trepidation of the owners of having a thousand people walk through. So you've really got to hold their hand and, um, and guide them through it. Um, the bottom left hand is a picture from the old timber mill. There was a lot of interest in, in the industrial sites. And the bottom right hand is um, the School of Arts building, which unfortunately was flooded in the last floods last month. Um, so yeah, a brief history of Maribor. It was first settled by Europeans in 1847 and is one of Queensland's oldest cities. Um, its primary purpose when its first settlement was uh, as a wool port, and then it went on to serve as an immigration point um, for free settlers. Um, and pe people experienced a lot of this, this port side aspect of this city on the day by visiting the port residence, the customs house, and the old bond store, which are all on Wharf Street. Um, as well as architecture, Maribor had a lot of heavy industry, including ship and locomotive construction. Obviously, last year we opened the um, timber mill, and next year we want to have a few of the um, really old engineering plants. 
um, locals are very proud of this history. So that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to find a way that they could engage with it, that they could use the reference points, the landmarks, to explore that history and talk about the untold stories. And um, so we looked around and we saw how well Brisbane Open House had functioned as a real good one single public day to really open up the, um, the great architecture around and allow people to walk through it and um, experience it firsthand. Uh, Brisbane Open House is part of a worldwide concept that has been used to show distinctive architecture in many of the great cities of the world. Um, Open House London was the first where the concept started in 1992 by Victoria Thornton with the aim of fostering a better understanding of architecture and the built environment outside the profession. Uh, Victoria was frustrated by the barriers between the architecture profession and the general public, so she set out to make you know, some of the more important buildings accessible to all. And um, that's really spread to, I mean, cities everywhere are starting to do it. All the Australian capital cities have done it. Last year, Maribor was the first non-capital city to do it, uh, and then Geelong has also done it, and a num I know a number of towns are, are looking at it, many Queensland towns. I mean, any Queensland town could do it, but I mean, I would think particularly Toowoomba, Gympie, um, Mackay, and um, I think it's a really great way. It's, it's um, a real focus one day of the year when you can just talk about your town, talk about the important way that architecture imp interacts with um, the public. Obviously, in Maribor, we focus on the heritage buildings because it's what we're known for. So most of the buildings would have been built from the 1870s to the early 20th century. Um, importantly, a key concept of Open House is that it is um, a free event so that it's accessible to everyone. We had a very limited budget of about $5,000, and um, it was a real, uh, we didn't know how successful it would be, but we were really blown away with it. On the day, um, we had, across all the 20 buildings, more than 13,000 visits. Just through Badao House alone, more than 1,300 people went through on the day. We had more than 140 volunteers at all the buildings, talk, walking people through them, answering questions, telling them the interesting stories behind the buildings. One aspect that worked really well that we took from Brisbane Open House was a photography competition. So we wrote to all the, all the photography clubs in the general driving area around Maribor, and it was just great to see people on the day. Um, on the day um, with tripods, and then that meant that following from that, we had um, a really great art exhibition. Um, so, and importantly, what's come out of that is um, the, the research and the stories that have come from each of the buildings, as you can see from the map that was on the back of all the fact sheets. Uh, there were 20 buildings to spread across the town. The great bulk of them are in the CBD, so that people could walk between them. Um, we present working with um, members of the Department of Environment and Heritage, such as Mary Burns, uh, the Heritage Council, the National Trust, local historical societies. We put together fact sheets for all the buildings, um, and particularly when they would cover the architect, the year constructed, the materials, but really importantly, the quirky and interesting stories. So, for example, one of those, so we have Battle House there, and then two pubs, the Engineers Arms and the Globe. The one on the far right, the Globe. Um, that was never on our list of buildings we wanted to go in. It just happened to be I knew the owner of it and he wanted to be involved. It's an old pub. At one time, there were 59 pubs operating in Maribor. And during the research, it turned out that this was the roughest one. And, that, um, and so there were all these interesting stories that people could tell them about it, you know, about brothels, about opium dens, and about a guy who used to drive his horse into the pub. And, and people know this building because it was a convenient store for decades and for the last 30 years it's been an accountant's office. So they interact with this building, they know, they see it, they drive by it, but nobody knew that it was a pub and that it had this really interesting history. And so this is a way that people can interact better with their history. They know the building, but now they know a lot more about its, its place in the community. Um, and so yeah, I think everyone found this event really worthwhile. Um, we did a lot, we, a lot of research was published arising from it. We had partnerships, as I said, with the National Trust, historical societies. We got people interested in their, um, in their local history. Um, next year, we've got it scheduled for the 26th of October, 2013. Uh, well, this year, um, this year we're incorporating a lot more um, new experiences, particularly in the outdoor areas, like um, walking tours of Queen's Park and, uh, and the old cemetery as well as an archaeology, an archaeological excavation at uh, the original Maribor town site, which was abandoned after about a decade for a site they thought wouldn't flood. And it's got a lot of, um, and so we've got an archaeologist who will bring people in on the day, and members of the community can watch or get involved in, in the actual dig, a bit like, um, I think there's a TV show 
um, time team. So just on one day, that we'll find one specific sort of historical question we want to look into about part of the building. And it'll, I think it's a really great way that can, people can get involved. People are coming forward wanting to be involved, the schools, um, churches. And um, so we have no shortage of volunteers. And I think it's, it's really worked well for the council and the National Trust and the historical societies who, who saw the potential in the buildings um, to generate this interest in the stories. And um, it's certainly become a regular event in Maribor. And I'd welcome any of you who want to come along for the day. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, George. And that globe now becoming an accountant's office probably means it's still one of the dodgiest buildings in town. <laughs> And our last speaker from the panel session is Mayor Clifford Harrigan. Clifford, please. Morning, uh, afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I think I'm getting hungry. Yeah, um, yeah um, I haven't got a uh, slide. All my knowledge is up in my head, so I'll just talk straight from my head. <laughs> Unless you want to hook that thing into my head and we get... Uh, first, I just want to uh, acknowledge the traditional uh, Bama clan groups from this country where I'm walking on. Bama means indigenous people from where I come from. And I uh, also like to take, uh, thank Coral Duggan for inviting me down here, all the way from Woodjul. Had to uh, cross flood waters and swim crocodiles, <laughs> infested waters. Yeah, that's why I checked everything before I hopped on the plane. <laughs> And I'd also like to thank um, Janet in front here, who I met last year at the LGAQ uh, uh, dinner at the convention center while listening to Ice House and James Morrison. And yeah, she mentioned something to me about coming down, and I was uh, yeah, excited to come down, get me out of the office anyway. So, yeah. Um, where else I start? Uh, my, uh, where I come from, my um, four clan groups are uh, the uh, Dikarba people, Palkanwara, uh, Dupiwara, and Darpa people. And um, they're from Wujul and also Hopewell. So a lot of the stories that the voice passed down to me were from those two communities. Because my dad's from Wujul and my mom's from Hopewell and some of the uh, Prominent people who come from my communities are Noel Peason, I guess you probably know him, and also Matt Bowen, who plays for the North Queensland Cowboys, who's a cousin of mine as well. Yeah, Cowboys. <laughs> I'm a Dragon supporter anyway. <laughs> dragon. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think uh, what they wanted me to talk about was. Uh, some of the uh, knowledge that um, some of our elderly people up at my area, passing it down to a lot of the young people, but a lot of the young people uh, today, I don't know, they call them the Y generation or some, or Twitters or whatever they are, Diva Chat and people. A um, lot, of, lot of the young people nowadays um, aren't interested in uh, listening to a lot of culture and stories, customs, whereas in uh, my era, back in uh, early 70s, there were still um, some very strong cultural practices still going on. And um, so a lot, a, lot of, a lot of that stuff I've, I've sort of inherited a lot, and I'm passing it on to my kids and some of my nephews and nieces, um, I don't know, because uh, a lot of people over 60, up, up my way, you could count them on my fingers. There's not too many left. And um, I think we need to uh, record a lot of this stuff, because I, I, I regret my two grandfathers. I never met my grandmothers because they'd passed on back in the 60s and 50s. But, um, I was around when my two grandfathers were still alive and they used to tell me a lot of stories how they were removed from 
from their uh, tribe and taken away to Warabinda or Palm Island or even further south. But uh, they came back to where, where they were born and bred because they were born out in the bush underneath a tree or um, in, a, in a cave. And uh, I remember one story my grandfather told me. Um, he's from a place called uh, Normanby River. They call it Bulgan Warra. And uh, he uh, used to live in a cave. And uh, his father was a Chinese fella because back, back up in then days they had uh, the gold rush up there. And uh, so his grandmother... I still remember this story when I was about 10, 10 years old, he telling us around the fire. And uh, his grandmother went and hit him in a, hit him in a cave. And, um, and uh, there was 500 uh, police on horseback came to uh, rescue a lot of um, him and his sisters and brothers. And uh, a lot of them were taken away. And um, so uh, they... The, uh, the police on horseback, they were shooting all these people and he was watching all these people getting shot. And, uh, but the more they were shooting his people, the, his people were spearing them on the, on the horseback as well. So it was a big battle. If you ever look up, it's called the Battle at Battle Camp. And uh, it's probably on Google or something. And that was about in 1885, and he was there actually when when the battle was going on, and um, yeah, it was a pretty sad, sad story. Um, yeah, because back then they used to remove a lot of the uh, fair-skinned people. Because his mother was a uh, full-blooded Aboriginal lady, but his dad was a, a Chinese Malaysian Malaysian father. And there was a lot of those kids up there, so they had to remove them from those uh, clan groups. And um, yeah, so he he never got, got to meet his meet his um, uh, father, and his mother and grandmother grew him up. And and uh, a bit further west from his clan group, um, they used to eat a lot of the white settlers and miners and Chinese and that. Not my group, the other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but sometimes I wonder because a lot of them used to wander all through that country. And, <laughs> and yeah, I, I love, yeah, because they, grandfather said um, they didn't prefer to eat the white fellas because they were too stringy and hard to chew on. <laughs> And I don't know if that's true. I said, well, you, you should have cooked them a bit more or something. I don't know. <laughs> they would prefer the more Chinese and the more other related because they were soft. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they'd wait for them in, the, um, in a valley. And when they, because there was that much gold up that way, um, they'd just knock them on the head or spear cattle. The, pastoralist cattle and um, horses, whatever, and eat, eat them, so, yeah, so. yeah, and that's good, yeah, but, yeah, I don't know, every time I go to Cairns or come down here, I always go for Chinese or something, I don't know, it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, um, yeah, also, uh, my other grandfather, who's from uh, Hopevale, He's a traditional owner from Hopewell called, uh, and that country there called, uh, it's called Dupiwara, his clan group, and it means red soil. And they were brought up with um, German missionaries who, who were very strict, and they'd get, and some of the stories they'd tell me, he'd get whacked over the back by a stick or whip or whatever, long cane for just dropping a piece of bread on a, on the ground or something like that, and I thought, you know, and you could see when when these old fellows were telling a story that some of the tears in their eyes were, you know, their eyes just glass over, and they must keep that in their head for over 80, 90 years. So, yeah, that's why 
mention it to the young people nowadays. I said, you know, you, you got it easy nowadays. Like even my daughter, like back in my era, back in the early 70s, I grew up in a tin shack with a dirt floor. We had to get firewood for, uh, to make food. Um, had to go to the well, get water, and bath in the cold water. And, um, and we used to live, um, live on a pig, pig and um, cattle farm because my mum and dad used to look after um, pigs for this uh, butchery company. So when it was feeding time, um, I used to help my dad get a bucket of mangoes and you see about 200 pigs come from all over the place and they just knock you over and you know, you, you think they're going to eat you, you know? So I used to just chuck the bucket and run <laughs> and climb the nearest tree. But they were, yeah, but they, they were really hard, hard days. But, um, but um, I think what the, uh, I think the IKC are doing is going to be great to record all these stories before most of our elderly people pass away because... They're just dropping like flies. Yes, everyone knows that our health um, is worse than the rest of the nation. So, yep. Thanks. Thank you, Clifford. Okay, we've got a little bit of time, about uh, 10 minutes before lunch, that we can uh, take questions for our, for our panel members. Are uh, the mic rovers around? Yep, they are. Questions? Thoughts, feelings, reflections? We've got a question down the front. Would, uh, that's okay. We'll just get a mic down here for you. Oh, oh. I've got a mic here. Would you mind saying name and where you're from as well? I'm Margaret and I'm a mother in the suburbs. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, a theme that I've sort of thought about today is authenticity. Now, Mary Rose, we had the big fat whopper scenario coming from you and we've got sort of more factual, or, or in inverted commas, factual approaches to storylines coming from the library's idea. I just wonder, um, it's, you know, it's no, it's in its postmodernist world, how writers, Leah, how you feel, you know, the stories, is authenticity something that plays on your mind as a concept? It, you know, where does it fit between this faction, the fiction, and how do the stories fall then in a library context? Should we give that to Rose or Mary? Can people hear Mary? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. great. I really like Mary Gordon. Yeah. 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 Um, I wrote a book about maternity care and uh, 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 women's birth stories to me are really, you know, that we've hit the sacred sort of epiphany. And so um, I wanted to respect the women whose stories I was telling and I did exactly the same thing, had exactly the same experience with the publisher of what, you want to what? Um, and and, and it, that was a journey, it was a terrific journey. In fiction, authenticity is a different thing. But it, the funny thing was, you know, I started out writing in Falling Snow, not interested in war and not interested in in history at all. You know, every time I thought of history, I just felt tired. I just thought, oh, you know what I mean? This kind of, the, 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 and the fiction writer has not the same duty of care to history that the librarian has, I'm sure of that. But by the end, there's not a thing in here that isn't authentic. And in fact, most of it is based on what really happened. Because what really happened was so much more interesting than anything I could make up. And, and because I, I, I kind of came to know through their, what they'd written, the women who'd worked at Royamont, and I wanted to honour them um, more than anything because they did something absolutely amazing. You know, they went, 16 of them with nothing, um, to an abbey that had no power, no heating. Um, there'd been horses living in the stables two weeks before they arrived. And within a month, they'd opened a hospital that was one of the greatest hospitals in, in the Somme region of World War I that looked after French and British soldiers. So, 
you know, I, I'm hooked. Can you hear that? I, I got hooked. Uh, so, but uh, authenticity in fiction is a different thing. Um, if you listen to Noddy, you'll find authenticity. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, I mean, authenticity for the library is obviously, you know, paramount in what we do. Um, the library, you know, at its heart is a collection of, um, of knowledge and ideas. In terms of presenting exhibitions, we, um, we don't sort of skewer, you know, the, the information, but we do have to present it in a way that's creatively engaging. So it's in a way that um, can present information um, so that all levels, you know, so young kids, you know, everyone can come along and there's something that can hook them into. So they have, they get a better understanding of, you know, what we're presenting or there's new, new knowledge or new learnings. Jeanette. I feel I have to respond on behalf of the library. I know, I know, I know Naomi has, but I think, I think what we try to do in the library sector is um, make sure that we're collecting enough of the alternate voices and, and the different perspectives because we're certainly about the game of, of making sure the truth is recorded, but people have different perceptions of what the truth is and I think we can have those alternate stories, which means that other people in the future can make a judgement about which, which one is closer to the truth. And, and so it's up to us to make sure that we don't deny anyone's story, that it's, that it's recorded either in the documents or in the, in the digital stories or in the, in the events and the exhibitions and, the, and the, uh, the opportunities we have for people to tell a different story. I mean, next week there will be a, a launch of a book here at the State Library, which will create some interest because um, it has some controversial history about Queensland in it. And we want to make sure that we're the place that those stories can be told, even if the current establishment doesn't feel that that's the truth, it's still nevertheless a place for that information to be expressed. And I think libraries are about making sure we've got those all those voices. Any story told twice is fiction, and I think that's true. <laughs> okay, we've got a question up the back row. Um, hi. Uh, my name's... Oh, God, that's loud. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Jan Gillies. Um, I'm just... It's, it's a, an unformed question. It's more like a, a kind of bubbling of ideas that come from all the um, am amazing voices and stories of the day. But I'm thinking... Um, post uh, Leah's talk this morning also that um, 2017 will be 50 years since the referendum and inspired by all of the stuff that happens in this place and with Kuril Dagan and um, the floodlines and, and the stories of the, the two councillors, both quite different perspectives and also just saw on stage the secret river in Sydney um, with the, the balancing of Kate Grenville's white version um, of history with the um, indigenous stories being blended in, into it in a different perspective. Anyway, I guess what I'm thinking is, is there, you know, how, how, where do you get your idea, your inspiration? Who decides what's going to be the next big exhibition? And, and, and wouldn't it be amazing to capture um, the stories of people like Uncle Joe Kirk and some of the other storytellers around Brisbane and, and people to, to really create something super duper that was um, indigenous and non-indigenous voices together telling, telling the story of the 50 years since referendum and where are we and um, the bad and the sad and the ugly and the true. Um, you know, we've all been talking about reconciliation but we've never actually had truth and reconciliation um, in Australia and yeah, it's kind of just throwing it out there. Okay, so an idea for a program in 2017 around the referendum. Does any, anyone want to comment on how a big organisation like this makes decisions about what's on? What's on? So, um, so the, the, that, the, tw the 50th anniversary of the referendum has been on um, SLQ's agenda for some time, um, certainly strong within Queensland memories, um, priority um, areas. Uh, it's also been discussed at a, a broader level in terms of um, potentially it can be a programming opportunity across the precinct. Um, at, here at SLQ we have the, the Lambert McBride papers um, from that period and we have displayed them in, a, um, 
in um, conjunction with Kuril Dargan with an exhibition we did a number of years ago and we had the display in the reference centre, so in the reference library. So we're certainly aware that at this stage there's a lot of research that needs to go into that project and it's certainly something that we're um, working towards. So in terms of how do these ideas come around, so certainly looking into the future and seeing what are the major anniversaries um, coming up, what can be um, you know, addressed through a, a curatorial program and um, or you know web-based program and uh, taking those discussions um, to the precinct. Uh, so yeah, there's lots of different ways that they come to the table, but that is certainly on the cards. Jeanette, you want to add anything? Okay, it's um, one o'clock, and so if anyone's absolutely, if we got someone jumping up and down, uh, I, was, I was just. Um, I don't know if the message has floated through to Jeanette. But, um, uh, there were, just to add to that, there was a, a at the NASLA, um, the National and State Libraries of Australasia, th there is also a move to do a, a national effort in recognising the 50 year anniversary of the referendum. So I think, um, I think, and Queensland's been a really key driver, I think it was Louise's idea to, to actually do it. So I think um, it's been really good to get that and there's been consensus across the country that that is a worthwhile thing to do. So it's good to know that we can be um, making a big deal of it in Queensland, but it is being picked up nationally as well. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, it's one o'clock. Um, hopefully, um, hopefully you got a lot from the, the panel. I myself, I found it very rich and very rewarding to hear you know, an artist speak about responding to faction and, and the material that you can get access to, as well as hearing about, hearing about how you can tap into something that's so iconic in terms of our weather and our water and, and how that whole programming can both put an can draw from a collection and create a collection and create, create new knowledge, and the buildings, the, the absolute environment that we're in and how you can work with that, uh, you know, the, the public realm, if you like, and the buildings that are out there and bringing the two together and places and the people and, and Wudjil Wudjil and the stories that are just inherently in that community and how being there and being part of that and putting something like the IKC there be in itself begins to capture and ensure that, thing, that those stories are not, are not lost. Uh, and hopefully that's given you a lot of um, uh, inspiration and, uh, and also hearing from Lear in terms of the uh, the potency of what you're actually involved in doing and hopefully it's given you lots of ideas and new life and thinking about your forward programs and the stories that um, that are held in your collections and your and your communities um, it's now one o'clock so I'd like you to thank our panel I'm aware there wasn't much time for uh, talking for questions uh, from to the panel, but I think they'll be around over lunch, and lunch is going to be served again next door. And then I think again at 2 o'clock, am I right? Somebody tell me from the... 1.45, is it? Someone tell me that that's correct. Yes, just nod. 1.45. Some of you will be meeting again in the, uh, in, in, at the edge. So if you don't know where the edge is, I can explain it to you. I can explain it to you at lunchtime. Thank you. And we have one more little bit that we need to do, and I almost forgot that, so thank you, Jeanette, for standing up. We have a little presentation that we'd like to, to make to our um, mayor. From Clifford, would you like to come up here? I've, I've got something which um, I'd like to present to the mayor of Woodrow Woodrow because... Um, in the interests of us making the uh, documentary heritage of, of uh, Queensland accessible, we go through our collections in the John Oxley Library and we've identified um, photographs and maps that um, we would like to make available, here probably in a digital form and certainly uh, available in the local community where they've come from or that they're about and they refer to. But as part of our protocol, we, we don't do that without cons consultation with that local community. So since uh, Clifford's here, I'd like to present him with this set of images which he can take back to the Indigenous Knowledge Centre in Woodjil. And uh, what we'd like to do is start a process of consultation to see if these images can be made available. So this is for you. Take that.